Hello, scholars. Welcome back. Mr. Long here, signing on. Today for World History, we're going to be looking at closing out the French Revolution and focusing on the legacy or some of the long-term consequences of the French Revolution. Let's go ahead and get started. First off, here's our agenda for today. We're going to review some of the factors that caused the French Re Revolution. Again, nothing in history happens in a vacuum, so we have to understand this cause-effect relationship. We're then going to look at absolute monarchs, basic human rights, nationalism, secularism, meritocracy, and decolonization. Factors causing the French Revolution. Uh, I have a little flowchart for you guys. Hopefully that'll help organize this information for you. The three main causes are going to be these guys here. And obviously, if you're looking at the flowchart, these three are going to cause the French Revolution itself. So let's do a little quick summary on each one of these as we go. First cause for the French Revolution, so I'm going to go ahead and put a little number one over here, are the Enlightenment ideas. We read a little bit about the American Revolution and how many of the Enlightenment ideas, such as uh, social contract, consent of the governed, separation of church and state, these different ideas coming together to inspire the uh, founding fathers for the United States, fellows like James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and they're going to come together to create a, at least a philosophical framework for the United States to fight for their independence and then build a country based on certain ideas. In France, instead of using fellows like Jefferson and uh, Madison to push some of these changes, they're going to use some of the philosophes that we looked at, such as Rousseau and Voltaire, and they're going to begin to demand things like equality, liberty, and democracy. Equality between the classes. There is talk about gender equality. However, this is still going to be a pretty patriarchal society after the French Revolution. But again, this idea of equality between the social classes, between the third estate and the first estate and the second estate, setting some of the framework for revolution. Liberty, freedom from oppressive governments, especially absolute monarchs. It's hard to have liberty when you have a king who can do anything that they want. And democracy the people getting a say in their government and the decisions that their country are making. That is going to help lead to the third estate embracing enlightenment thinking. The third estate, again, are the common people in France, that lower social class. They start to see these enlightenment ideas like equality, liberty, and democracy, and they think, hey, why not us? Let's go ahead and start shooting some people in the face and cutting off heads to get these ideals uh, and turn it into a reality. So that's the Enlightenment ideas that are building into the French Revolution. Second one over here, economic troubles. Uh, due to high taxes and various wars in France, you can look back at King Louis the, Sun, the 14th, the Sun King, uh, his building of Versailles, how expensive a project that was. That's not something that's going to change. It's expensive to maintain it, but also various French kings are also adding to the national debt. Pair with that a decline in the economy, people uh, aren't having uh, as high paying jobs as they did before, they're not exporting the same level of goods due to all the turmoil in Europe, and so the economy itself is going down. High taxes, high cost of living, and grain shortages are going to lead to many people being hungry during this time period. And when people are starving to death, they get kind of desperate and maybe a little bit crazy. High national debt and refusal of banks to loan money is going to continue to stagnate the economy. And all of these economic troubles are going to be pretty flammable kindling for revolution. And most revolutions you look at, not all, but a lot of them have to do with uh, the suffering of the common people and wanting some kind of change. Uh, the Russian Revolution, when we get into the 20th century, is going to be a good example of that. A week later, King Louis XVI, down here, whoop, there he is. King Louis XVI is going to pay little attention to national problems. He's more focused on his own royal court, hanging out in Versailles, eating as much as he wants, and just kind of being king. I mean, come on, it's good to be the king. Might as well enjoy it a little bit. Queen, Queen Mary Antoinette, King Louis's wife, uh, she's a member of Austria's royal family, and that xenophobia and that 
nationalism that, oh, she's an Austrian by birth, and even though she married into the French royal family, she's still Austrian and she's still an other. She's still someone else who's not French. Uh, she spends a bunch of money on she spends a bunch of money on luxury items, things that aren't really necessary, like fancy clothes and parties. And if you're a common French person starving to death because there is enough bread and you don't have any money to buy bread, seeing her spending money on fancy dresses and parties are it's not going to sit really well with you. Might give you a little bit of a bad taste. Uh, the high national debt that we mentioned with economic troubles. Uh, the King Louis isn't really doing anything to fix that problem. Um, and so his lack of strong leadership is just going to make this national debt and the economic situation all that much worse. And so that's going to be our third cause leading into the French Revolution. So all three of these combine, creates a perfect storm, and then heads are going to get cut off, and the revolution is going to peter its way out. And to go ahead and talk about some of the legacies of the French Revolution and how the French Revolution is going to alter French and European society. Absolute monarchs. As you read, King Louis XVI, this splendidly dressed fella over here looking very dapper, uh, things are not going to go well for him during the French Revolution. He was put under house arrest and then he decides to flee. He gets caught fleeing. The French, got the French interim government and the people decide, well, if you're going to try to sneak out of the country, we can't really trust you. So let's go ahead and uh, give you a very extreme haircut with the guillotine and go ahead and cut off the king's head. So King Louis XVI is dead, very dead, super dead. Um, and the way the French people went about deposing of the French king who... Not long ago, the French monarchs were absolute monarchs who had all the power. It gets people thinking, hey, if we can do this to King Louis, we can do this to pretty much anybody. Because again, King Louis with the absolute monarchy idea, if he's really destined to have the right to rule by God and God let this happen, then something weird is going on and we need to question our perception of absolute monarchs and whether they're human or divine. And now that he's kind of a headless corpse, definitely more human than divine here this is going to have a pretty impressive ripple effect as it spreads out across europe not necessarily with kings being decapitated but the idea that people the people could rise up against a king during this time of absolute monarchs and kill the king if the king's not doing a great job this is going to lead to uh a reaction from other European monarchs where they want to see the revolution fail because this is challenging the status quo. Kings are very content with their power. They like having control. And for a while, people have just been pretty content to let the king do their thing. Again, oh, it's represented from God. Cool. Why not? Let's have this thing. But if the people can rise up against the king because things aren't going well and kill the king and the royal family, that's something that the other monarchs of Europe aren't going to want to see. And so during the French Revolution, while there's all this turmoil and this reign of terror going on in Paris, other European monarchs are launching invasions and wars against France to try to snuff out the French Revolution in its infancy to protect the institution of the monarchies around the rest of Europe. And so that's, that conflict and those wars are going to see a little guy named Napoleon rise to power as he's defending France from these counter-revolutionary monarchies that are trying to put an end to the French Revolution. Basic human rights. This is something that we looked at with uh, some of the Enlightenment thinkers like Hobbes and Locke, uh, where... People are born with certain unalienable rights, and whether you're born a king or born a peasant, you still have the right to life, liberty, and property. Uh, first line here, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. It's an Enlightenment idea. Again, not incredibly revolutionary, but it's an idea that more people start to accept as fact. And we already looked at that with the Declaration of Independence here in the United States and how that idea comes into being. Uh, Thomas Jefferson paraphrases uh, Hobbes and Locke saying life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness instead of life, liberty, and property. Uh, some other ideas in the Declaration, uh, sorry, 
the Declaration of Sentiments of Human Rights, Liberty, Property, Security, and the Resistance to Oppression. This is going to give us the abbreviation, the uh, shortened version. Oh no, I forgot a thing. I'm so sorry, Mr. Long. Minus one point because I don't know how to type. Um, liberty, equality, and fraternity. The Declaration of Sentiments is going to be mostly focused on men and not women. Uh, many women want to see this included. They want to have equality with men to try to shake up the uh, patriarchal society of the time. However, that doesn't really come into reality after the French Revolution. But much like the United States Declaration of Independence, again, we said all men are created equal, um, which blatantly wasn't true at the time as we had people writing that who literally owned other people. Much like the U.S. Declaration of Independence, this idea from the French Revolution is going to serve as a framework for future equality. So though it's not going to create complete equality at the time, it's something that future generations fighting for equality and liberty are going to look back on and go, oh, hey, remember those ideals that we all said we were going to do? Yeah, let's actually do it this time and see some progress made in regards to social and gender equality uh, later on. So again, not completely revolutionary for the time, uh, but the legacy of it is going to build the things that are pretty great from a modern context. Nationalism. Love this painting, by the way, mainly because we have this little drummer dude just strapped with two pistols all about the revolution. That's just a terrifying image of a child with pistols running around during the French Revolution. Yeah, French Revolution was a crazy time. Um, nationalism. Without a monarchy to unite the people, a question starts to arise of what's going to keep us together. Whereas before the French Revolution, there, were, there was King Louis, there was a monarchy that secured and symbolized the nation. Well, if you don't have a king or a queen to rally around and to form your government around and therefore the people around, what's going to bind the people together? And this is going to be something that uh, we refer to as nationalism. Um, it's, the definition is down there at the bottom, an idea or movement that promoted the interests of a particular nation. We see this quite often here in the United States. Think about how many people you see wearing American flags on their hats or their shirts or uh, athletes wearing it on their shoulder or just people flying American flags outside their houses just because they want to. Uh, maybe it's the 4th of July and you'll see more of them or some random day that's not tied to a national holiday and yet you still have people uh, waving the, the uh, American flag with a lot of pride. Americans are pretty nationalistic in that regard. And before the French Revolution, you know, you have some taste of nationalism, but after the French Revolution, the idea of being united by your nation state and having pride in that nation state takes on a new extreme. This is going to have some pretty horrifying consequences when we get into the early part of the 20th century with World War I. Uh, with millions of bodies stacked up over the cause of nationalism. My country is better than your country, and I'm willing to kill and die to prove it. And millions of people do just that. So this is kind of setting that ball in motion that we're going to see get blown up during World War I and then subsequently in World War II. Secularism. This is the principle of separation of the state from religious institutions. In the United States, we may know the phrase separation of church and state. Uh, this was coming about uh, mostly following the scientific, uh, scientific revolution, following the absolute monarchs, where with the absolute monarchs, the divine and state were very tied with the divine right of kings. You're marrying the two to give more legitimacy to the kings. That's going to cause some problems, and during the French Revolution, uh, in large part because of the uh, clergy's influence and power in France, people get very jealous of that and want to overthrow that institution or at least separate it from government so that the church can do their thing over on one side, the government of the state can go and do things on the other side, and you don't have them intermarrying and mixing together. Uh, I think that's all I need to really say about that one. We've talked about that one a fair amount with 
uh, absolute monarchs and then scientific revolution bringing these ideas of rationalism and logic and more like cold hard math to things rather than uh, speculation and superstition. And then the other week uh, in unit three, we talked about uh, the enlightenment kind of reinforcing the idea that government should go one way, church should go the other way because they're different parts of society and they shouldn't be married together. That just causes a lot of problems. Uh, so secularism is a term that we use for that. Again, seeing that come into the more public light during and after the French Revolution. All right, meritocracy. With the French Revolution, hereditary roles, such as the monarchs, which is hereditary title, if I am King Long, my child will become king or queen after I die. It's hereditary. It passes down from father to son or mother to daughter, father to daughter, whatever it may be. The Enlightenment ideas disapproved of hereditary titles and positions. They were saying, hey, if you're a competent person, you should rise through the ranks. This also ties pretty closely with democracy because you're not marrying uh, power to birthright. That if it's a democracy, you should vote for whoever you think is best, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their noble titles, and let that be the basis of your government. Um, let's see here. Definition of meritocracy, government or the holding of power by people selected on the basis of their ability. Hopefully that sounds like something I was just raving about. Uh, we like to see this in the United States, especially in the current period. If you are competent at your job, you should be promoted or get a better leadership position. Doesn't matter who your dad is. Shouldn't matter who your dad or mom is. If you're competent, you should move up. And so this is uh, government off of merit, tying it back to that root word where the merit of you, the value of you, how competent you are with your own skill set. Decolonization. With the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars that you're going to get into with 404 and 405, there's a lot of chaos in Europe, especially with France and Portugal and Spain and some of these imperial colonizing powers uh, that's going to draw their government's attention closer to themselves. During this period, uh, especially during the Napoleonic Wars, which we're about to get into, so pay special attention to that, these are happening between the years roughly like 1800 to 1815, I believe, was the Battle of Waterloo. And so during this time period, the European governments like Spain and France and Portugal that have overseas possessions, there's so much craziness going on in Europe with Napoleon running around conquering uh, various nations that the other colonies of these nations. So let's look at Spain, for example. Spain has these territories all over the Americas. If you're looking at the map here for 1800, Spain are going to be the green colonies. Well, if Spain is being conquered by France and is fighting wars against France, they're not really prioritizing maintaining their colonies. And so during this time period, various colonies start to drift away from the mother country. They start to decide that they want self-rule, that they want to be independent, that they want to form their own countries, and they start to break away from Spain. And with Spain so preoccupied fighting France, they don't have time, energy, soldiers, or resources to enforce their role in the colony. So it gives the colonies in the new world an opportunity to break away from the old world. Uh, primarily in Spanish and Portuguese colonies. I talked about Spain. Portugal is a cool one because during the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleonic France actually occupies Portugal. The Portuguese royal family flees to Brazil. And while they're there, they're treated really well by the Brazilians, or at least like the Portuguese colonizers of Brazil. After the Napoleonic Wars, the Portuguese uh, royal family, they decide to in effect, reward Brazil for their loyalty and their hospitality by pretty much giving them their independence when the Brazilians ask for it. So whereas the Spanish colonies, and if you're looking at the map uh, around 1830, you can see these major battles from guys like Bolivar and San Martin that we'll talk about at a later date. They're fighting battles against the Spanish government to assert their independence. You don't see that happening in Brazil. Brazil actually becomes an independent country uh, peacefully. 
there isn't a huge coup, there isn't a revolutionary war, there's some political discussions between the two, and they just decide, yeah, we'll let you go your own way. Seems fair. And Rizzo has a pretty cool backstory with that one. So hopefully this video was pretty brief. I'm not watching the clock, but I hope I was able to keep it right within the time frame that it should be. The French Revolution, depending on the historian, is more revolutionary than the American Revolution because of what it led to with the Napoleonic Wars and the way Europe changed as a result of that. Um, so hopefully this is connecting some of the dots between the Enlightenment ideals, the fall of absolute monarchies, or at least like the decline of that influence and power, the revolution itself, and then how the French Revolution is going to be changing Europe and the world for the better or worse, that's a debate we could probably have in class if we have time. Um, but there's certainly a lot to talk about in regards to economic history, social history, political history, even the religious history with secularism. There's a lot to this that, unfortunately, we don't have all the time in the world to get into. It'd be a lot of fun to go into it, but unfortunately, we have to keep this ball moving. So keep in mind some of the notes from the video here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you guys know where to reach me via email, class, or on Canvas. And I think that's all I have for you guys today. Um, dramatic pause as I double check myself. Yep, I think I'm good. So I'm going to go ahead and sign out. And I hope you guys do good things. Mr. Long, over and out.